where the solar system and terrestrial planets like Earth come from, part two. So previously I had talked about um, this issue and uh, we had, I had gone over um, uh, the formation of the solar system, uh, its place in the universe, and um, how the nebular hypothesis um, is the main explanatory theory for how our, um, our system gets here and, and its composition. Um, and then from that we get star formation and accretion into larger bodies until we eventually get um, planet-sized bodies. So now we're going to continue. I had left off last time talking about um, meteorites in Antarctica. We're going to talk some more about that and different objects um, in the solar system um, that are worth worth talking about um, that are related to this. So let's let's take a look. So um, meteorites um, they come from uh, the asteroid belt, um, and uh, they can be collected in places like Antarctica. Um, where they're easy to find because they stand out on the surface and tend to not uh, break down very much. Um, so the um, looking back at the um, universe, uh, sorry, the um, solar system in general, um, we have um, the Sun, Venus, uh, Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, and then up to three astronomical units away, we have the asteroid belt, which has the objects um, uh, that produce most of the meteorites. Um, so these are some of the some meteoroids um, that are, are out there. Um, some of them are, are some of them are named and they've been studied for a long time. Um, so they're objects um, that are persistent and that have names that we um, can keep track of. Um, so these objects are um, small rocky bodies. Um, they're called minor planets, um, and they're the materials um, from which the terrestrial planets uh, are formed. Um, so you start stacking up these objects and you can and you can build an earth-like planet out of them and not just earth but um, all of the um, different rocks that are on earth um, the water from earth the water in the oceans is is from these asteroids not necessarily present as water um, but the material is is there all of the material that makes up uh, you and me and the, your, the computer that you're on and and the, the the house around you and the world around you starts off as or, or all these atoms were locked up in chondrites and other, other meteorites. Um, so a, um, uh, a very common type of meteorite is, is called a chondrite, which I just mentioned. Um, and chondrites, um, they haven't changed since the start of the solar system. So they're, they're, they're very early and primitive objects. Um, and whether there's different types of chondrites, um, <clears throat> they all have different kind of histories. Um, so there's different types of them. Um, but they all have roughly the same chemical composition. And so we call that the chondritic composition. Um, and so the chondritic composition is the same as the composition of the sun if you remove its hydrogen and helium. Right, so that's, that's kind of a strange way of putting it, um, but it's what's left over of the solar nebula once you remove um, things like the hydrogen and helium and, and put it all into the sun. Now, of course, not all of the heavier elements um, stayed out of the sun. They all fell, a lot of them fell into it, into the sun also. And so most of them um, ha have most of their amount um, has been removed. Um, so there's only a small a fraction of them left of the heavier than, than helium elements. Um, so the chondritic composition is the starting point of the terrestrial planets. Right? So if you took a chondrite and you just melted it and you started counting up the atoms of different types, you'd see different proportions of these atoms and different proportions of these elements. Um, and that is that proportion is the chondritic composition. So if, if I take a sample of you know, my computer, I will not find the same proportion of elements. If I take a sample of a piece of wood or a rock outside, um, I'm not going to find that chondritic composition. Um, but if I could somehow melt the entire earth and stir it all up um, and take a sample of that and then, and then look at the proportion of different elements, I'll find a proportion that matches the same proportion that chondrites have. Um, so, so we can we don't we obviously can't do that for the earth but we can we can examine the chondrites and um, see what their composition is um, so so here we have i have a, a, a illustration of um, asteroids perhaps chondrites falling into a um, maybe a protoplanet or or a larger planet and um, or a minor planet or a full planet and um, they are you can kind of imagine it when you build the object, build this planet up out of these smaller objects, if the smaller objects all have kind of a similar composition, then the planet is just a large um, version of that. It'll have the same composition of it. 
as, as, as those chondrites. So Earth, Venus, Mercury, and Mars all start off with that composition, and then things change over time, right? There's, and, and so that change from the chondritic composition, composition to the current um, setup that you see on Earth, right, um, um, is, is the history of geology. It's geological history, right? Um, it's, it's, it's the way that the Earth has changed over time. So there's lots of events that have gotten us away from the chondritic composition. So I said if you melt the whole Earth, you'll get a chondritic composition. But if you actually go out and, and, and analyze um, uh, some mountains or the ocean floor or the atmosphere, you obviously don't get those chondritic compositions. How come, right? If everything was just chondrites, how do you not have that composition, right? How did things become different from these weird things called chondrites, right? And that the processes that resulted in those differences are the processes that created the world around us. Um, right, so what is the chondritic composition, right? Um, so the solar, well, r rather, what is the, the, the original um, solar composition? So the solar nebula is, like I said previously, 99.999% hydrogen hel and helium that was created in the Big Bang, and then 0.001% of other elements, right, that were made in earlier generations of stars. And it's that 0.001% that the Earth is made up of. So we start off with we start off with this nebular composition, and um, and that's very similar to the composition of the sun. And as that nebular gas flows into the sun and is cleared out from the um, the nebula itself, and as the nebula goes away, and we start having a solar system instead of just a nebula, um, what's left behind are these other heavier elements. So there's still hydrogen, helium, and other things like that, but then. And there's all the other elements that are on the periodic table in this cloud also. Um, but 35% of what's left over after, all the, after the sun is formed and the nebula is kind of gone, 35% of what's left is oxygen. 30% is iron, another 17% is silicon, 12% is magnesium, and 6% is everything else. It's, it's the hydrogen, helium, lithium, um, uh, all, and any, other, any of the other elements, aluminum, all those kind of things, right? Um, so just six percent makes them up. So so a third of you know a third of what's left is oxygen, and another third of what's left is is iron. Um, so this is the chondritic composition. So you don't need to necessarily you know re remember that those numbers, but but you should know that if we should understand that chondrites have a particular composition and and uh, that it's been measured and, and it's measurable. Um, so so why should anyone even care about that, right? Well, um, chondrites are important um, because they are what the the terrestrial planets are built up of and they tell us about um, or the chondrites themselves tell us about processes in the early solar nebula um, so they can tell us about um, uh, some of the first things to form in the solar nebula so we I've talked about it previously and um, I've talked about the fact that the um, gas and dust in the solar nebula can, can condense and cool off and you can start getting solid materials but what comes out first Right, what are the first materials to form? Right, I mean, ice, you know, melts at a certain temperature. Um, metal melts at a very different temperature. So if we start with a high temperature and we start cooling things down, we obviously don't get everything all at once. Right, we we slowly get different things at different times. So there are there are things that condense at high temperatures. They're called high temperature condensates. And then there are things that condense at lower temperatures. They're called low temperature condensates. And um, chondrites um, have a lot of these high temperature con uh, condensates within them. So if we want to look at some of the first things to form in the solar system, um, then we need to look at chondrites. Um, and so now here's another, so, so that was a, a in fact, let's go back, that's a picture of a, um, a chondrite, right? So this is a meteorite, it's been sampled, it's been turned into a thin section, these colors are the result of um, polariz polarized light analysis of the um, thin section. The rocks have physical properties. It changes the light as it moves through them. It gives them these bizarre colors. These are not the real colors of, of the rock. Uh, and so what you see here, are, what you see here in a circle, is a chondro, a chondrule, um, and the chondrite is made up of many chondrules. And uh, that C H O N D, chond, chond, whatever you want to call it, chondrule, chondrite, um, it's from a Greek word that kind of means a little. It means a little piece, and so it kind of means a chunk. I wonder if the words are actually related, right? If the English word is related to this chond um, uh, Greek word. Um, so they're the little chunks of the early universe that, form, that, that were the first things to form. Um, so that is um, a, a, a one chondrite. 
Um, here is a um, larger sample that has not been cut down into a um, thin section. Um, it's, it's, it's been sawed and cut, so we have a nice flat polished surface. And then you can see these small chondrules within it. And there are also these highly reflective, um, well, they look kind of white or gray, but they're actually in, in, in person there, they look like little sparks of metal. And that's because they are. They are, they are pieces of metal, um, like iron and nickel, um, that were present in, in the early solar nebula. Um, and as the chondru chondrules formed, these little chunks of, of rock formed, uh, and they kind of agglomerated together, they agglomerated uh, along with some other materials. And so they capture materials um, uh, uh, that were also present um, in the early solar system. Um, so um, how old is the solar system? It's usually the number you're given is 4.5 billion years, right? Well, where does that number come from? That number is the age of chondrites. So people can do geo, um, uh, radioisotopic dating of um, chondrites and determine how old they are. And those um, uh, objects are some of the first things to form in our solar system. Um, so that's not necessarily the age of the solar nebula. It's not the age of um, perhaps even the protoplanetary disk, or at least not the earliest, earliest parts of the protoplanetary disk. Um, but that's the age of our solar system, where you could come here and you could see, you wouldn't see any planets, right? But you would have a star that we'd recognize as being our sun, Sol. Um, and um, uh, you'd have all the material that's going to eventually turn into all of us uh, rotating around it, some of it trapped as, as contracts, as these tiny little millimeter-sized droplets of material. Um, and so, um, yeah, well, let's look at the next one. So now, referring back to the... Um, solar system um, we have our terrestrial planets in this first zone and as we move further away from here we have um, decreasing temperatures right um, and so the chondrites were able to form um, uh, well so some of the materials that are in the chondrites were able to uh, in those meteorites that are called chondrites were able to form because they condensed from um, this hot material um, but the chondrites themselves look like they've actually been reheated they look like objects that have been heated into a liquid phase and then cooled off. And that's, what they look, that's why they look like little droplets instead of randomly shaped um, clumps of, 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 um, of rock or frost kind of thing that's condensed straight out of vapor. So they seem to have condensed from some kind of liquid, some, by some kind of, from some kind of melt. And so that's not predicted. That's that, that, that phase where you have molten rocky material is not something that ast astrophysicists and um, astronomers... Uh, expect. Um, it's not something that they um, can see with their theories about how stars and planets um, are created and, and, and evolve over time. Um, but it is something that geologists have. Um, and in order to really recognize what chondrites are, you also have to do geology. It's really not a, a physics question. It's a geological question. It's an earth sciences question. So that's, the, that's a lot of the stuff that's going on in our, our terrestrial um, a zone of the terrestrial planets. Um, if we look a little bit further out, we have the gas giant planets, right? So the gas giant planets are things like Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. And Jupiter is about five astronomical units away from Earth, uh, from the Sun, five times the distance of Earth um, uh, from the Sun. And uh, you can go out to Neptune, and that's about 30 astronomical units. So that's that's you know, the last planet, right? It's, it's a range of 30 astronomical units, 30 Earth distances, and you've covered the planetary um, zone of our solar system. Um, so planets like Jupiter and Saturn, um, they're made up mostly of um, gas, gases like hy from hydrogen and helium, uh, hydrogen and helium gas. Um, and so they form, uh, they're thought to form directly from the um, nebular material, um, the, the, as it accretes and grows, um, I shouldn't even say accrete because that's more of what's happening with the meteorites, um, but as it, as it agglomerates over time. Um, and so the composition of planets, the whole planet composition of things like Saturn and Jupiter, um, is going to be very similar to what the um, whole nebula looked like. So going, going back, 
<clears throat> so in, in this terrestrial zone, if you you can kind of imagine that you had all the same materials, you had the, the rocky materials and the hydrogen gas, but the sun drew in a lot of the hydrogen gas into it, and then the heat of the sun also pushes out and blows away um, the um, vapor, the, the hydrogen and helium vapor. But by the time you get out to these outer zone of planets, um, you're far enough away from the sun that the gases can still remain. So you can kind of picture the early nebula has the sun in the core of it, and then a big gap, and then a cloud, the cloud kind of returns, right? Um, for, for the rest of the um, of the solar system. And it's in that gap that we have the terrestrial planets. Now, interestingly, so the, the, these outer planets are, are gas and, and a little bit of dust, um, uh, but interestingly, the moons of some of these planets are, um, are terrestrial um, and, and, and potentially have a chondritic composition. I don't, I don't think we actually know that yet. Um, so here are the moons of, or some of the moons of Jupiter. These are sometimes called the um, Galilean moons of Jupiter. Um, and so we have Io, uh, the moon Io, uh, Europa, Ganymede, and Callisto. And um, it's kind of strange, right? Because they're made up of rocky material, um, uh, and they, they're in orbit around this gas giant. Um, they should be made up mostly of of uh, hydrogen and helium gas, just like Jupiter, or just like Saturn and and, and the other planets. Um, like Neptune and, and Uranus. Um, so, why are they are they rocky? Um, so now Io is is um, mostly rock, and the other ones are a mixture of rock and ice and gas, um, and, and, in varying proportions. Um, <clears throat> and so it kind of makes sense because we we expect there to be um, rocky material out in the outer solar system. It's just that we expect it to be, a, you know, that that 0.001% of, of the material that's present, right? So anything made from stuff in the outer solar system is going to be mostly um, gas um, with some rocky dust material floating around in it, right? Um, but these moons have, have, you know, anomalously, let's say, high proportions of rock. Some of them almost, are almost, you know, like, um, like Earth and Mars. Um, so were they captured by these outer planets somehow? Um, were they, did they have, are they the core of a planet that had a gas envelope that's been lost and then was captured by Jupiter? Um, I, I, I don't think that's something that uh, uh, is a settled issue. Um, uh, so it's kind of a, uh, I, I don't like to say mystery, but it's, it's an open research question um, that people are, are looking at. Um, here's kind of a neat thing. This is a, 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 a picture through a telescope of Jupiter and um, one, two, and three of its moons. Usually you can see four of the moons of Jupiter, but it might be that one was in front of Jupiter right now. Um, and so this was taken by one of our, uh, one of our students in one of our astronomy classes, um, Santiago Jimenez. Um, he took it this year. Um, and if you take a, you know, a, te a, a good telescope or even a good pair of astronomical binoculars and you know where to look, um, you can see these, these objects pretty readily. Um, and he got got a, a, a pretty good picture of them. Um, so that's, that is Jupiter and, um, you know, three of its many, many moons um, out there, you know, each night or until they, you know, can't be, can't be seen at, at certain times of the year. Um, so our solar nebula, again, was 99.999% hydrogen and helium. And that's what the sun is, is like. And that's what the um, outer planets are like. And so that, um, so, so that's what the, um, that's over here. And then our chondritic composition, right, what's left when you blow away most of this gas, are things like chondrites and, and the ast chondrules and chondrites and the asteroids that, that are chondrites and the um, rocky planets. And so, um, you know, another way that we can get at what the nebular composition was is to look at the, the sun and, and we, can, we can analyze it with spectroscopes and other kind of instruments and, and get ideas about what materials are mostly there. And then we can look at things like chondrites, and we can kind of, you know, um, reassemble um, the nebula by mixing those two um, uh, sets of observations together. Um, and then we, can, then we can know about things during the early solar system. Um, so now even further, further out into the solar system, um, uh, beyond Saturn, you have the planets Uranus and Neptune. And so um, here, you're so far from the sun that it's cold enough that you can get condensations 
of carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen of, of elemental elements that we don't normally ever think of as, as being, being anything other than gas. So we get ices um, on these planets. So these, these planets are um, made of gas, but also a lot of ice. And it's, and it's not, you know, water ice. It's, you know, um, things like methane turned into, into ice and, 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 and uh, materials like that. Um, so uh, Uranus has 21 moons, Neptune has eight moons. Um, these objects are very far out in the solar system. Um, and um, they can be, um, well, they're, they're, they're kind of odd, right? But uh, both Uranus and Neptune have um, relatively circular orbits, just like the rest of the planets. Here is, so here, this, this picture is of the outer solar system, um, or part, or further out part, anyway. And um, here we have Pluto and its orbit. And so Pluto was an oddball planet for a long time because of this tilted and very elliptical, very stretched out orbit. Um, in fact, sometimes Pluto is close, the, the closest neighbor to Pluto is Neptune. But sometimes it's actually um, very close to the sun. Um, uh, even closer than it is to... Um, uh, to, to Neptune, or actually it's, it's, it passes in between the orbits of Neptune and, and Uranus. Um, so it's not, um, it's an unusual object, right? And now beyond Neptune, we have something called the Kuiper Belt. And the Kuiper Belt um, is named after an astronomer named, named Kuiper. Um, and it's a, a huge um, swarm of objects um, that are made up of ice and, and dust. And um, there's, there's many of them. There's up to 100,000, perhaps more than 100,000 of them. Some of them are, are, are um, more than 100,000 that are 100 kilometers in size and a lot of much smaller objects. Um, and so Pluto actually, for part of its orbit, is within the Kuiper Belt. It, it is a, a Kuiper Belt object, or a KBO, um, or a trans-Neptunian object. Um, so it has this extremely elliptical orbit, um, and it, which is also very tilted. Um, and so from this Kuiper belt, we get a lot of comets. Um, so let's, let's talk about comets now. Um, so comets are um, pieces of ice and dust that are left over from the formation, after the formation of the giant planets. Um, so they're like this final leftover part of, of the um, solar nebula. So similar to how um, meteorites and, and chondrules are um, objects from the very early part of the protoplanetary disk. They're, comets are kind of an analog um, for, for that. Um, so, so things like you know, Jupiter and, and Saturn might have um, cometary type of um, compositions. Um, so these comets are, um, they have very, very unusual and long orbits, um, and sometimes they're knocked out of their orbits um, and end up coming into the um, inner parts of the solar system. And when they do that, because they're ice, um, uh, they're not stable. Um, as they get closer to the sun, they get heated up. Um, and, and so that's why we're able to see them. The, the ice um, that vaporizes off of them can also um, catch light and shine. Um, and it produces this cometary tail. Or the, the, I think the word comet even means something like hair. And it's supposed to look like the hair coming off of, strands of hair coming off of an object. Um, So um, here's a graphic kind of showing some of that. We have our, our large um, outer planets. We have a comet falling into the middle of this, into the interior parts of the solar system. And as they do that, they are um, uh, becoming, they're being destroyed, right? They're, they're being heated up, they're losing material, they're outgassing um, every time that they pass close to the sun. And then they, they, as they come in, they're heated up. As they come, go out, they're heated up. And then they go back out far into, you know, beyond the orbit of, of Neptune. Uh, and they slowly come back again. Um, and so we used to think also that, um, um, so these objects can potentially hit Earth. And, and we kind of thought because Jupiter is such a large planet that it might often catch these, these um, comets and other, other pieces of space debris that were going to hit Earth um, and, and prevent an impact. Uh, but this is kind of not really, this used to be a very popular idea. Um, it's still, it's actually, um, 
It's not as popular anymore, not as widely accepted. Some people wonder if even Jupiter is drawing in a lot of these objects. So you have to kind of imagine that you have, you know, very far away, very high up in space, you have these, these you know, shards of ice um, that are just dangling there. And as big, massive objects like Jupiter are moving around with all their crazy n number of, of, of moons moving around them, they're kind of creating these disturbances. And, you know, any one of them can cause one of these giant shards of ice to fall um, and, and basically rock it down to us and, and hit Earth. And like I said, some of them could be 100, you know, 100 kilometers um, in diameter. Um, so they can, they can be very large and... Um, you know, usually when we think of impacts on Earth, we, we think of things like Chicxulub and, and the end of the Cretaceous, and we think of meteorites, um, but potentially a lot of impacts are actually from comets. So the relative proportion of impacts on Earth from asteroids to, to comets um, is not known, and it's uh, kind of hotly debated um, right now. Um, so now, We've talked about the, the inner part of the planet, the inner part of the solar system, the region in which you have planets, and then we've talked about this Kuiper belt. It's about, it, it's, it starts a little after 10 astronomical units, it ends around 1,000 astronomical units. One astronomical unit is 150 million kilometers. So around here, it's 100 times that 150 million kilometers. And that's the Kuiper belt. And so that, it's called a belt because it's, it's kind of like, it just wraps around the solar system and doesn't extend all the way to the poles of the solar system or anything like that. Beyond the Kuiper belt, there is something that, that does do that. We, we have something called the Oort cloud, and that's shown here in, in or at least part of it here is shown in, in green. And so this is a, 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 a cloud at the extreme edges of the solar system up to 100,000 astronomical units, 100,000 times 150 million kilometers, extremely far out. And it has a lot of um, um, again, icy bodies, everything out, out, out this far out is, is ice. Um, it has a lot of icy bodies. It has comets that potentially have very long, uh, long period comets, comets that take a very long time to, to, to do one of their orbits. Um, and we don't know a lot about it. It was proposed by, by a, um, a researcher named Oort, and um, the, he, he reasoned that, you know, if, you're, if, if this early sun is blowing away um, uh, the hydrogen and helium gas, um, that it shouldn't just go out into the, you know, into the rest of the galaxy. It should more or less still be trapped around the solar system. And he said that it, it should be in a cloud, you know, uh, at the edges of, of the solar system. Um, and so people have been studying that o over time, and they've been able to identify objects within this proposed Oort cloud. So we, 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 for a long time, have named it after him. Um, but so some very, you know, potentially dangerous comets um, and debris come out of, out of that Oort cloud. Um, so anything beyond the orbit of Neptune is called a trans-Neptunian object, um, or a TNO. I mentioned that we have um, uh, Kuiper Belt objects, KBOs. Um, so there's lots of acronyms for these different things. So Pluto is a trans-Neptunian object. Um, Eris is also a, 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 a trans-Neptunian object. So here's a, I got my mouse over. Here's Pluto um, and Eris. And so Pluto is the um, uh, Greek and Roman god of the underworld. Um, and the things, the, the moons of Pluto are, are, are kind of horrific things associated with that god, like, like Kerberos, uh, Kerberos, the um, dog that guards the underworld, the Hydra, a multi-headed monster, um, uh, the river of death, uh, and then the, the boatman that takes you across that river of death to bring you to eternal night, or Nyx, right? So very, very terrible things, right? Um, Neptune is the god of the ocean, the god of the deep. He's, it's, it's a planet that's very deep out in space, right? That's where these names, a lot of these names come from. Um, and so a while ago, I, I don't recall the, the, the year exactly, um, but it was a few years ago, they found an object um, that is um, basically the size of, the same size as Pluto. And it's a trans, another trans-Neptunian object. And they said, well, people, people were saying, this object is, is very similar. It's, 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 it's the same as Pluto, right? It's, it's basically the same size. It has the same kind of weird orbit, but it's, if that orbit is fine for Pluto and, and Pluto's a planet, then, then Eris should be a planet. Um, and so, um, you know, people have been debating for a little while, for, for a long time, in fact, if Pluto really is a planet because of its orbital characteristics, um, its, its unusual orbital characteristics. And so I think when these, these workers found this object... Um, they were very aware of the implications of it, 
and they named it Eris, the goddess of chaos. And so this object um, throws, you know, the the nighttime sky into chaos because now we don't even know what a planet is, right? Um, uh, because of it, we had to say, uh, we had to make some decisions about whether or not to start adding many, many more planets, but that who knows how many more Erises are out there. Um, or do we now have to remove a planet? We have to downgrade a planet, right? And so that's that's kind of a big deal. It's it's a big object in the in the um, in, in in the astronomical um, field, right? So um, kind of a clever name, I think. That, that I think that's why they named it Eris, right? Um, and and sure enough, there there are other objects that are very similar. So here we have Hamawia and Maki Maki. Uh, I'm slaughtering those names very badly, pronouncing them very badly. I'm sure, and and a whole another whole set of other trans-Neptunian objects that are very large, um, and that are potentially, um, well, that are not just you know comets, right? Um, so we have one called Sedna, which is very far out, and um, this is the Earth. I think my picture is covering up the Moon, but this is a, a, a representative of of the diameter of the Earth, and then there are these other objects. So they're large. They're not just like asteroids or or small, small bodies, right? They're significant. You wouldn't want any of these hitting Earth, right? So here is, here are the orbits of some trans-Neptunian objects. Um, over here is Sedna. And the other ones have, um, you know, numerical alf and alphabetic um, uh, designations, a lot of the ones that I can see on, on this chart. Um, but notice these have, if I showed a per most people this chart, and I explained them. This is this is a chart of some objects in our solar system. Um, what do you think about them? People, I think, would mostly think that these are comets, right? This is how we usually look at the orbits of a comet. They're very very elliptical, right? They're not circular. They're stretched circles. They spend a little bit of time in the inner solar system, and then they spend a lot of their time farther out. So people don't, people don't necessarily have general familiarity with all of that, but I think people understand that comets have these weird elliptical orbits, right? That they, that they go out very far, they take a long time to come back, like Halley's Comet 75 or 72 years, whatever it is, um, takes a long time to complete its orbits. <clears throat> but, you know, like I said, one of these is Sedna, right? Which, you know, for, for all, you know, if things have been a little bit different, could have been a planet, right? Um, and one of these could, is, is um, I don't think any of these ones shown here are Pluto, but Pluto has a very similar kind of orbit. So a lot of these trans-Neptunian, Kuiper Belt, Oort Cloud objects that we don't know very much about, they visit our area of the solar system um, on very, very long but regular um, time scales, uh, on very, very long but regular periods. Um, so potentially there's, there's, there's a lot of interesting things that could be happening out there, right? Um, it's, it's kind of a, just, just a throwaway topic, really, um, that, that these things are kind of like comets, even though they're also planets. And comets hit Earth, do other planets like them, or, or quasi-planets, uh, dwarf planets hit the Earth sometimes. Um, and then bring materials here. Um, it would certainly, certainly be a bad, bad scene to, to have that happen. Um, so now we'll go back to... Um, <clears throat> I want to stop here because it's, it's kind of a different topic now. I want to come back to the um, terrestrial planets in a little more detail. Uh, so for now, we're going to go back and stop this, this talk.